and welcome to Science Weekly, keeping you up to date on all science-related things. Before we get into breaking news, let's talk about our organism of the week. I will give you three hints to help you figure out what this week's organism is. Hint number one, this organism likes to live in terrestrial volcanic hot springs, as you see here. Hint number two, it can only survive at temperatures of 75 to 80 degrees Celsius and has to be in the presence of sulfur. Hint number three, it reaches optimum growth at pHs of two to three. That's like living in boiling orange and lemon juice. Wow. Can anyone guess what this organism could be? You're right, it's Sophilobus. Sophilobus is actually the genus containing multiple species. But today we'll be focusing on Sophilobus Sulfagicus P2, Sophilobus acidocaldrus, and Sophilobus tacodi as our extreme organisms. Lucky for us, we have a scientist in the house who has been studying this class of archaea his whole life. Let's give a warm welcome to the professor and his assistant. Thank you for being on our show today. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about such an interesting organism. Well, first off, could you please describe what Sophilobus looks like? Why, of course. To help show it better, I'm going to have my assistant draw a picture of it. Well, it kind of looks like that. Here's a picture for comparison. Sophilobus is an irregularly shaped, is irregularly shaped, and uses flagella to move around. Very interesting. This does sound like an extreme organism. So, where would Sophilobus likely to live? Actually, Lauren, Sophilobus can be found almost anywhere there's volcanic activity, like. Yellowstone National Park, Mount St. Helens, Iceland, Italy, and Russia. Here you can see one of the terrestrial volcanic hot springs where Sophilovis tocadi lives. Wow, that definitely looks like an extreme habitat. Now I know Sophilobus is an acidophile and a thermophile, but how is it adapted to live in such acidic environments? Well, I'm glad you asked. My assistant and I have come up with a list of adaptations the genus Sophilobus has that allows it to live in such an acidic environment. Assistant, why don't you tell the audience your favorite, favorite adaptation? Well, my favorite adaptation is the tetraether lipids. The Sophilobus acetocaldarius tetraether lipids contain both a caldarchaeal uh, hydrophobic core, or the GDGT, and a caldarchaeal hydrophobic core. Try saying that five times fast. So we've abbreviated it to make it easier as a GDNT. The combination of these two lipids makes the Sophilobus acidiocaldarius tolerant to both high heat and acidity. I'm going to expound on that if you don't mind. Speaking of the tetraether, tetraether lipid monolayer, in archaea, lipids are based on ether linkages as opposed to ester linkages that are found in eukaryotes and bacteria. It is formed by the condensation of glycerol with isoprenoid alcohols, 
that containing 40 carbon molecules. So the end result is a 72-membered macrocyclic tetraether made from two 40 carbon diol units and two glycerol units that are joined across what would be the bilayer, but by producing the tetraethers is really just a monolayer. It is this adaptation that allows the genus Sulfolobus that protects the sulfolobus from the damages that come with living in the highly acidic environment. Another adaptation for sulfolobus is its metabolism. Sulfolobus primarily grows lithoautotrophically by oxidizing the elemental sulfur it lives on into sulfuric acid. However, it can also grow chemoheterotrophically by oxidizing, by, by metabolizing various carbohydrates with the help of sulfur. It uses the glycolytic pathway to transform glucose into pyruvate, which is sent to the citric acid cycle. Which the end products are ATP and NADPH which is used to drive oxidative phosphorylation. All right. Next, we will talk about how sulfolobus protects its DNA. Oh, I've heard about that. Sulfolobus has a lot of mechanisms that help protect its DNA. Can I tell them about a few? Sure, go ahead. Well, for starters, sulfolobus requires a unique version of tRNA stem loop formation to prevent its loss of its 3D shape, which can happen by means denaturalization. The tRNA are modified after transcription so the molecule will still function. They also protect against exceeding the melting point of base pairs by producing high GC content sequences to alter their all over melting point. Tandem DNA repeats and other sequence patterns also assist in functioning at specific temperatures along with heat stress proteins that bind and stabilize nutrients function. Well, thank you for filling our audience in on that. There are also some other exciting things to look for in the future from research being done on sulfolobus. A strain of sulfolobus, sulfolobus tocadi, is known to oxidize hydrogen sulfide to sulfate intracellularly, which is used to treat industrial uh, wastewater. There's also a strain of virus that uses sulfolobus sulfatoricus for protection. The lysogenic virus cannot survive at the, in the acidic and hot environment of Sulfolobus sulfatarcus. This relationship allows the virus to replicate inside the archaea without being destroyed by the environment. And here is Dr. Ken Stedman with more info on this research. Bumpus Hell is a laboratory for biologist Ken Stedman of Portland State University. The reason that we're here is we're interested in looking for viruses that live in some of these hot springs. That anything can live in the extreme temperature and acid levels here is a shock to many. But the presence of so-called extreme viruses could lead to the development of new medicines, as well as provide insight into questions that go much further afield. We're interested in you know, just finding out about life in extreme environments on Earth for potentially finding out about you know, life which could be in other environments, on other planets. Viruses that thrive in 230 degree water would seem to pose quite a threat to humans. But for Stedman and crew, infection is no real cause for concern. If we were happen to fall into those hot springs, we might get infected by the virus, but we'd be long since dead. Well, thank you for both being on the show today. And I think that wraps up our time that we have for this broadcast, Organism of the Week. Thank you for watching Science Weekly, and we'll be back after this short commercial break.